Okay, everybody, settle down. Thank you. Marius just gave me the signal to start, so we will. So, um, welcome to the afternoon edition of the Nativist Club. Hope everybody is in the right mood. Um, I told Alfonso that I'm not sure anybody would disagree with his definition of nativism, but if any of you do, see Alfonso after class and he'll straighten you out. Um, so this morning, Alfonso kind of laid out the rules of this meeting and what makes it different. Uh, there's one rule he left out, and not only did he leave it out, but he broke the rule, and that is introductions of speakers. So in the past, we have not given lengthy introductions at all, and two reasons. One, people know all these people already. And secondly, we didn't want to take any time away from them. I, I, yeah, but that's not, Ingrid's not going to be penalized for this. It was understandable why Alfonso did that, because he had such a long history with Mike McCloskey. So that was forgivable. Um, and I told them before Mike spoke that one of my all-time favorite papers, a science paper, was a study that uh, Mike and Alfonso did on uh, uh, folk physics, um, which was published like in 1981. And I point that out just so you have a sense how really, truly old these guys are. So <laughs> you're very welcome. Okay, so our first speaker is uh, Ingrid Johnsrud. I can tell you that she's from Western Ontario, and I'm not going to tell you anything else, <laughs> except that we're thrilled that she accepted our invitation. So. Well, thank you very much, Alex. I'm thrilled to be here. Okay, um, so in the spirit of spring, uh, I thought I'd present um, some relatively uh, new work here today, some nice chewy data that maybe we can uh, talk about afterwards. Um, this was the title that I, I submitted to Marius, but um, in preparing this talk, I realized that preparing a talk is a lot like packing for a trip. You take out everything you think you're going to need, and then you put half of it back. And there just wasn't space for the brain, so there won't be any brain in this. It's going to be all good old-fashioned psychophysics. Yay! Um, okay. So uh, when I was invited to come and speak here, I was thrilled, of course, but I was also a little bemused because I don't, I mean, I, of course, we all study concepts, but I don't study them in the, you know, semantic representations in the brain kind of way. Um, I firmly believe that perception and action are, are deeply and intimately intertwined, but I don't really study action. So that left me with objects. And I thought, yes, I do study objects. I study auditory objects. Um, specifically, um, in the work that I'm going to be presenting, I'm, I'm going to be talking about voices. And voices are a really interesting kind of object because they are actually two objects in one. When I, I speak, you understand the content of my speech, and if I say nativism, and if Alfonso says nativism, you know, in some way that's the same thing, right? And so there's some normalization that has to happen for you to um, appreciate um, speech as language objects. But at the same time, voices are highly distinctive. Alfonso has a very different voice to me. And uh, that's appreciating the voice as an object in a very different way. You may have a pre-existing representation of um, Alfonso's voice. You may have a pre-existing representation, maybe at least some of you will, of, of my voice. And those are quite, quite distinct. So voices are interesting for, um, for that reason of being uh, kind of two-faced. So uh, when I say objects, I'm really talking about um, speech and voices. OK. So I'm going to start by talking about sound, the problem of sound. Um, and I'm going to start with a quote from uh, Wolfgang Metzger's uh, book, uh, Gesetze des Sins. I apologize to the Germans in the room for my pronunciation. 
of that. So um, Metzger was a gestalt psychologist, and he wrote a book about the laws of seeing. But in the introduction to that book, he starts, the achievements of the ear are indeed fabulous. While I'm writing, my elder son rattles the fire rake in the stove. The infant babbles contentedly in his baby carriage. The church clock strikes the hour. A car stops in front of the house next door. One of the girls is practicing on the piano. At the front door, her mother converses with a messenger. And I can also hear the fine scraping of the point of the pencil and my hand moving on the paper. In the vibrations of air striking my ear, all of these sounds are superimposed into a single, extremely complex stream of pressure waves. Without doubt, the achievements of the ear are greater than those of the eye. He then goes on to write a book about vision. Um, but that is a really wonderful illustration of the problem. Uh, Chris Plack, a psychoacoustician in the UK, has his own take on this problem. This is his pictorial representation of that essential problem. Here he is with his girlfriend talking to him while they're listening to music and there's car traffic outside. All of those waves are mixing together. And um, both uh, Chris Plack and another uh, psychoacoustician in the UK, Chris Darwin, have likened this uh, problem to being at the shore of a lake and watching the waves lap on your feet. And by the pattern of interference of those waves, um, figuring out that there are three swimmers in the lake and what strokes those swimmers are doing. So that is computationally, a, a, seems like a very difficult problem, but it's one that we don't seem to have much trouble with. Um, perhaps the most remarkable aspect is that the impression we have of sound, even when sounds are presented in a mixture, as they almost always are, our impression is of a single source, typically, right? We're pretty good at separating those sources perceptually so we can attend uh, to the single source um, that we want to attend to. <clears throat> How do we do that? Well, there are a number of um, different mechanisms that have been proposed. A lot of these um, are based on um, Gestalt ideas. Al Bregman wrote a very long book in 1990 that illustrated a lot of the principles underlying auditory perceptual organization called auditory scene analysis in his world. And um, of course, there are primitive grouping mechanisms that are based on the acoustics of um, of the sound, so characteristics like frequency, timbre, onset time, we group according to the similarity or dissimilarity of those things, proximity in time matters. And I'll give you an example of that here. So this is a bit of foreshadowing. This, I'm going to come back to this task. Um, this is a rather peculiar task developed by um, folk in the American military for uh, studying multi-talker uh, intelligibility under different circumstances. All of the sentences are of the form uh, ready call sign, go to color number now, so ready baron, go to green seven now, for example. I'll play an example of that. Okay. Hmm. Ready baron, go to green seven now. Right. So that's pretty, and, and all you have to do is on the matrix in front of you, you just press the color number coordinate to which Baron was told to go. Pretty easy if you only have a single talker. Gets a little more difficult if you have multiple talkers. If the talkers are of different sexes, it's not so bad. Ready, Ready Baron, Ringo, go, go to, to green red seven now. now. Meh. Um, if the talkers are different people but the same sex, it gets a little more difficult. Ready, Ready Baron, Charlie, go, go to, to white green six seven now. now. As a hint, it's always green seven that Baron's told to go to, in case you're wondering. And then if it's the same talker, right, games you can play if you're recording people, it's really hard. Ready, Ready Baron, Charlie, go, go to green seven one. now. And that difficulty um, is reflected in, in accuracy rates, as you might expect, where <clears throat> um, when you have the same talker, uh, as shown here, the ability to pick out that color number coordinate is, is rather poor. Whereas when um, the talkers are of different sexes, so their fundamental frequencies, their voice pitches are very different, then it's a lot easier. Right? So this is just an example of how acoustics can facilitate perceptual separation of, of two voices. <clears throat> 
The other kind of um, heuristics, the other type of heuristics that can play into perceptual organization are knowledge-based heuristics, which Bregman called schema-based mechanisms. And I have a couple of examples of those. So this is where your knowledge informs the perceptual organization of what you're hearing. First, I'm going to give you an example from um, a colleague uh, Andy Dykstra's work. And I want you to hear, there's a, um, an isochronous repeating tone sequence here, and I want to just see if you can hear it. Anybody hear a repeating tone sequence in there? Ah, very good. Okay, here's a clue. And here it is again. So once you know what you're listening for, it all seems so clear, right? So your knowledge is really informing your organization of that otherwise inchoate tone cloud. Uh, here's another example. Listen to this. What was that? <laughs> Some shaking heads. I'll play it again. Okay, for those of you who've experienced sine wave speech before, you may have recognized that as sine wave speech. Here's what you heard. Okay, I'm not going to say it. You're just going to read it. Now you're going to hear it again. Okay, so this time you may have got it complete with the British accent. Right? Okay. So again, another example of how your knowledge really changes how you, how you organize uh, auditory um, uh, stimuli. Um, for a long time, I've been really interested in, in the kinds of knowledge that can help in speech perception. And in part, this is because um, I'm interested in older people. I'm becoming an older person. I have many older people that I care about, and I, it really bothers me that as people older and um, peripheral hearing changes, it can be difficult to communicate, social events aren't quite so rewarding. So how can knowledge um, and experience mitigate the effects of peripheral hearing loss? That's, that's where I started with this. So um, in, walk, in uh, starting down that road, it's helpful to think about well, what kinds of knowledge are there that, that could help? Um, and I'll, I'll just go through some that have occurred to me. Uh, this is not by any means exhaustive. So if you think about a communicative situation, you have a talker who's intent on conveying a message, you have a listener who's intent on picking up that message. Um, we haven't developed telepathy yet, so the message has to um, come out over the articulators, get passed through the environment, bounce around, um, maybe be masked by other competing sounds, and arrives at the listener's ear. Well, what does the listener know that can help them with this? Well, the listener knows something about what's in the talker's head, right? So the listener knows maybe the topic that's being discussed, the listener and the, and the talker share knowledge of the world, uh, they share a language, uh, right, that has rules to it. Um, the listener may know something about the talker, him or herself, may know that person personally, um, at least may know the sex and size of the talker, which can give you some information about their vocal apparatus, um, may be familiar with the accent uh, that the person is, is speaking with. Um, some you know, accents can be more difficult to understand than others, but if you have a lot of experience with that accent, of course, it becomes easier. And of course, visual, visible speech, if you can see the voice uh, talking, um, as Olivier was um, briefly alluding to uh, this morning, then of course that can make listening easier. At the environmental level, we seem to know something about the physics of sound. We have, it seems, um, this is work by Rich Freeman and others, we seem to have representations of the acoustic characteristics of different rooms so that we can predict um, the echoes that will happen in, different, in, in rooms of different, different sizes to a first approximation anyway. And that allows us to clean up the signal a little bit. Um, something that I'm going to be uh, talking about a fair bit is this idea of familiarity with the masking sound. So very often we're hearing sounds mixed with other sounds, and um, if 
many ways that knowledge could help. Right? So um, if there's a, a, a transient door slam or a cough or something, uh, knowledge can help you fill in missing information. So I'm showing a waveform here. And, you know, the, the, the knowledge is helping you um, de-emphasize that, that occluding masking signal. Um, it might in increase the effect of SNR, helping to either uh, perceptually enhance the target or attune the, the masker. And it might improve perceptual segregation. And that's um, what I, I'm most interested in, what I've uh, tried to focus on in my work. You can let me know where I've been. Well, I know I haven't been very successful, but you can let me know where I've been. OK, so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on voices, particularly familiar voices. And this is a, a list of the uh, papers that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and uh, these are the people who helped with the work. And in the interest of diversity, there have been a lot of pictures of young women this morning. I thought I would acknowledge an older male colleague <laughs> who also helped a lot. So the very first study I'm going to present was concocted with Bob Carlion over beers many years ago. OK. So the question we wanted to ask, um, when we started, people had been looking at familiar voices, but they would looked at voice, familiar voices in a rather artificial way. People had been trained in the lab uh, with, with voices that had previously been novel to them. And that's very different from when you really know somebody, right? Somebody you care about. So we thought we'd start with the ridiculous extreme of familiarity. We went through thousands. We've also done um, an experiment with mothers and their children, another very familiar voice, right? If you're a kid growing up, your mother's voice is you know, one you develop with. Um, but we're looking at spouses here, long married spouses. So um, this is your spouse voice is the first one you hear every morning, the last one you hear every night, every day of your life for years and years and years. Very familiar. Um, we wanted to know, well, how much do listeners benefit when hearing naturally familiar voices, particularly the older listeners? We also wanted to ask, how do they use that familiar voice information? Do they use it to match to a template, which according to Bregman is really the only way that you could use familiar voice information? Or are people doing something a little funkier, like using it to actually enhance the perceptual separation of voices? So um, Bregman, as I said, um, believed that familiar information only and he based that assertion on an experiment like this. So this is taken from um, the work of Dowling, uh, an older paper, and I, I just love the simplicity of the title, a single author, and a really elegant study. And uh, what Dowling did was he presented melodies interleaved with distractor tones, and the melodies were either familiar or unfamiliar, and the distractor tones were either familiar or unfamiliar. And he um, had the distractors and the melody either in the same range of pitches, or he moved them apart. And the question was, whoops, going the wrong way here. The question was, how far apart do you have to move the melody and the distractors before people could recognize the melody and the distractor? Oh, sorry. Um, how far apart do you have to move them in, in semitones so people could hear the melody clearly? And was that difference smaller if the target was a familiar melody? And was the difference smaller if the masker was a familiar melody? Um, so here's an example. You're going to hear um, a familiar melody, well, for many of you, maybe, maybe not for everyone, um, alternated with distracted tone, or distracting tones in the same pitch range. And it's going to be presented several times. And every time, uh, the pitch range um, of the melody, but not the distractors, will be transposed up uh, to semitones. And I'd like you to raise your hand when you can recognize uh, the melody, OK?
by then. So merrily we roll along, or Mary had a little lamb, but it takes a little while, right? And so what Dowling discovered was that if the target was familiar, if the melody, if the, if the, if the target melody was familiar, it took you fewer semitones to realize the melody than if the melody was unfamiliar. But there was no benefit of having an unfamiliar distractor melody, okay? And based on that, Bregman said, um, the familiarity of distractor sounds does not matter. It's only the ben you only get benefit from familiar targets. Period. Okay. Uh, I'd like to think that it's not so cut and dry, that in fact you maybe can get benefit from having a familiar uh, masker present or a familiar interfering sound present. And um, I've been on that quixotic quest now for some time, and I'll let you know how I get on. Um, that's what this talk is about. So. Uh, we use the coordinate response measure procedure in our first study. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's a very nice way of looking at uh, talker intelligibility, and you can cue the target by the word baron, right? So you just tell your participant, listen for the baron voice, press the color number coordinate to which baron is told to go, and that means you can change the baron voice. Sometimes it can be familiar, sometimes it can be unfamiliar. Another advantage is that in previous studies with the lab familiarized voices, people had used what are called open set sentences. So natural everyday sentences like, um, it was a sunny day and the children were going to the park. Um, the problem with that though is if you also have a familiar, unfamiliar condition distinction, people may be, um, may be more biased in the familiar voice uh, condition to guess at words, right? The, that familiarity might give them a sense of confidence and they might be more inclined to guess words. And um, as the Canadian hockey player Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. It's exactly the same thing here. Um, you sometimes get a shot if, you know, even if you've taken it wildly, sometimes it goes in the net. So sometimes if people are guessing, they're going to guess right. And so you could have an intelligibility difference in open set sentences, not due to a difference in sensitivity, but just because people are guessing more for familiar voices. So we wanted to avoid that. Here there's a single response in every trial. Um, the groups we tested were um, older people and middle-aged people. We had approximately equal numbers in those two groups. And you can see that they'd been with their spouse for a very long time, 27 years, 35 years. So these are really familiar voices. And uh, we tested everyone with three voices, the voice of their spouse and then two unfamiliar voices who were other participants in the study um, uh, who weren't familiar to the, to the listener, but who were sex matched to the spouse. Um, so Bob Carline calls this a wife swapping study um, for, for that reason. Um, so the target voice was familiar, the masker voice could be unfamiliar, that's this condition here, or we could have unfamiliar target voices and a familiar uh, masker voice, um, or all of the voices could be unfamiliar. Where's my cursor? There, all the voices could be unfamiliar. So we had effectively three different conditions, and we ran this at multiple signal to noise ratios in a windowless soundproof booth. It was very exciting for the participants. And um, here are the results. Here you can see there's a very strong effect of signal to noise ratio or target to masker ratio in this case, right? So this is the, the um, relative intensities of the, of the target versus the masker phrases. When the target was familiar, we see a very robust um, benefit to that. And we also saw a marginal benefit when the masker uh, was familiar. Um, and these are large benefits. So on the order of nine, six to nine dB benefit for a familiar voice uh, as when you're listening to it, when it's the target, and about a three to six dB benefit when the masker uh, is familiar and you're listening to a voice you don't know. Um, so we would seem then to have, because we have this familiar masker benefit, we were going to conclude that, okay, what a familiar voice is allowing you to do is to perceptually segregate two voices that you're hearing at the same time so you can attend to one or the other. Okay, that's, that was our tentative conclusion. Um, we found some interesting age effects in, in this study. Um, the first one we found... Um, was, well, this, this particular graph is not very interesting. So as age increases, accuracy declines. And at first blush, this looks like a peripheral hearing loss issue, right? Older people are more likely to have poor hearing, and we see that in the, in the plot. Well, when we look at the familiar masker condition, 
We also see a slight uh, negative correlation with age, but not, um, not quite as big, but not significantly different. But in the familiar target condition, we see no such decline with age. Okay? And so this is implying that this, this um, impairment we're seeing here um, is perhaps cognitive because our, the acoustics of the situation were very carefully matched amongst all three of these conditions. Right? Somebody's familiar voice was somebody else's um, novel voice. So the voices heard here as targets are exactly the same as the voices heard here as targets just swapped around. Now you might think, well, maybe this is a ceiling effect or something. Um, so we looked at conditions that were equated for performance um, at, at uh, different target to masker ratios. So we took a target to masker ratio where the performance in the novel baseline condition was equated to performance in the familiar target condition. We did that here. And you can see the same pattern applies. So even when the listening conditions are relatively advantageous, as here, plus 3 dB, it's a pretty good target to masker ratio, we still see this decline with age. So this, is prob this isn't an audibility thing. This is a cognitive uh, thing, we think. Another interesting aging effect was that, if you remember, we had two groups. We had a middle-aged group, 44 to 60, and then we had an older group, 60 to, to 80-ish. And we saw a different pattern of performance in those uh, two groups. So in the um, middle-aged group, we saw as much benefit nearly in the familiar masker condition as in the familiar target condition. There was no difference between those two conditions, and both of those were better than the novel baseline condition, of course. In this um, slightly older group, we saw a different pattern of results where performance in the familiar target condition, when you're listening to your spouse, it's all good, right? But then when your spouse is the masker, no benefit, just as though it was, they were um, uh, a stranger. So that was quite interesting. Um, not sure what to make of it, except that it, um, it may be an artifact of the materials, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So this all hinges on this familiar masker benefit being a real thing, right, in the younger people. And I worry that it may have to do with the materials that we were using, with the particular task uh, that we were using. So um, before I get to that, I'll, I'll just conclude what, what we tentatively concluded from this study, and then I'll go into pick, picking the problems with this study, <laughs> and then how we address those problems. So we definitely see a robust benefit when the familiar voice is the target, which is good news for spouses going out for dinner everywhere. Um, and we wondered whether this would be true for slightly less familiar voices, foreshadowing, next experiment. And our middle-aged group, at least, benefited from having the spouse voice as the masker, suggesting that maybe um, having a familiar voice in the mixture is facilitating the stream segregation, but this may be an artifact of the materials, as I said. So why, what's, what's the deal with the materials? Well, if you remember, all of the sentences are of, all of the, sentences are of the form ready, call sign, go to color number now. All the listener has to do is listen out for the Baron voice, and then press the color number coordinate that Baron was told to go to, and so all they're getting in a mixture of two voices is two call signs at the beginning, one of which is barren, and then two color number coordinates at the end. As few as two things that they have to remember. So they could be doing this retrospectively. If they have a familiar voice in the, in the mixture, right, they could be saying to themselves, oh, okay, well, was Joe's voice barren or was it the other one? And then they hold on to all the information they're getting, both color number pairs, and then at the end, retrospectively, they report their spouse or their not spouse, depending on whether Baron was their spouse or their not spouse. Okay, so effectively, the spouse is giving them this handy verbal label to hang on a voice, and then they can remember both color number coordinates and report retrospectively. And maybe that's why we are seeing a familiar masker benefit. We wanted to, because that's not how people listen to speech, right? We wanted something that would be more naturalistic, something more like the stream of speech, and you have to be tracking just the one stream, okay, and letting the other one go. Okay. Um, reasons to be cheerful, however. So, okay, maybe, maybe in artifact materials, we'll go on, we'll test something that uh, is a little more uh, natural, 
But I do want to just point out one experiment that we've done, that we've um, performed subsequently that uh, gives me reason to hope slightly. This was a study conducted by Fabien Sanson, and um, she used novel voices throughout, not familiar voices. She used the CRM procedure again, but what she was interested in is how does the consistency of a voice from trial to trial affect people's performance? One of the nice things about the CRM procedure is that you can mix up trials from different conditions. You can have a familiar target uh, trial followed by a familiar masker trial. Remember, people are just listening for the barren voice, and so that voice can be um, anything, really, right? So you can, mix up, you can mix up trials very efficiently. Well, Fabienne was interested in, well, what happens if you hold a voice consistent over trial? Do people benefit from that? And it turned out that people benefited not only when the target voice um, was held consistent, but also when the masker voice was held consistent. This doesn't look much bigger than this baseline condition where nothing's held consistent, um, but it was, it was different. Don't worry about these two. This was another control condition that we ran. It's not relevant here. Also, people made fewer... Um, there, there are two kinds of errors you can make in this task. A mixed voice error is where you report uh, a color from one voice and the, and the number from the other voice, right? Or the other way around. So you're mixing the streams, right? Don't cross the streams, but you're crossing the streams. That's a sign that there is no perceptual segregation. In contrast, a wrong voice error, both uh, color and number are from the same stream, but it's the wrong stream. So you've separated, you've just gone for the wrong option. And uh, what Fabienne showed was that um, the masker benefit was because people were making fewer uh, wrong voice errors. The, there was no difference amongst the mixed voice errors, but there was a, a significant difference in the wrong voice errors compared to this baseline um, condition, as, as in the target, um, the consistent target condition. Okay, so this is some evidence that some, consist that, that some kind of familiarity, a short-term familiarity in this case, may help um, you when that consistency is found in the masker sound. Okay. okay. We replicated uh, the familiar target um, and, um, study using a different um, corpus. Um, this is the Boston University Gerald corpus, the bug corpus. And here, it's just like the CRM, except instead of reporting a color number coordinate, you have to report all the words, okay? So it's harder. Yeah, Ugh. higher load on memory. You hear two phrases with two names, um, two verbs, two numbers, two colors or adjectives, two nouns, and you have to report either the bob words or the pat words. Okay. And here's the, the matrix that you use to report on. So um, you hear a pair like this. Bob bought eight new gloves. <laughs> and then you, then you report. And um, in case you're wondering, if, if I want you to listen for the Bob voice here. This is going to be really hard because of all the reverberation in here. It's easier over headphones, I assure you. So Bob. Bob bought eight new gloves. Anybody get... Bob bought eight new gloves. <laughs> well done. Okay, good. Okay, so um, this was a study done by my student Izzy Domingo, and um, we had two groups here. We had uh, spouses as before, but she also um, went for uh, people who were more in more casual relationships, so uh, friends. And there's a lot of variability here, and there's a lot of overlap. Uh, in the two groups, but in general, the spouses were older and had known each other for longer, and the friends were younger and had known each other for less time. Um, same conditions, and uh, the results were somewhat different to what we had seen before. Um, first, I'm showing you the uh, older spouse group. I should say she divided the spouses into two groups, um, as we had done in the previous study, just because we had a very wide age range. You can see the range is from 28 to 82, so we wanted to divide that. So she uh, used approximately the same age cutoff for the two groups as um, we used before to make two equally sized groups. And uh, we see this strong effect of acoustics in, the, in, these, in this older group here and um, not such a big effect of acoustics in um, this younger spouse group. 
And then in the friends, um, we see a rather similar pattern. There look to be differences here. There looks, there looks to be an interaction, but I assure you we've looked at these data repeatedly and there isn't an interaction. I think it looks like there is because um, izzy has been a bit naughty and she's um, started the, the graph, right? We're looking over a relatively compressed, relatively compressed range here. So the only effects are that, um, uh, well, there's a, a, a group by TMR interaction with um, the TMR affecting this group uh, more than it, it's affecting these two groups. And there was a significant effect of condition with this um, familiar target condition being the best. People are getting a benefit from listening to the voice they know. It's the only, those are the only effects we see here. So, um, oh, and I should say that the friend benefit, although it looks um, smaller than this benefit here, it's not, um, it's not different, actually. So we see a robust benefit for a familiar voice target. Seems to be true when the voices are somewhat less familiar. And we don't see that familiar masker benefit anymore, which made me sad. But um, we have removed a lot of familiar voice information here. I'm just gonna take a minute to explain that point. So what we have done here is we have done violence to interpersonal relationships, right? There's no visual information here. There's no spatial separation of two voices. Um, it's a very stereotyped thing that you're hearing your loved one or friend say. And we've messed with um, uh, speaking rates and patterns as well because in order for the words to overlap we um, had people when they were being recorded speak to a little um, line on the screen okay so they're very artificially being timed in when they produce the words of these sentences so we've messed with speech in almost every conceivable way except we've let them use their own voices and we're still seeing this robust um, benefit uh, when that voice is the target. If we allowed um, talkers to be a little bit more natural, I wonder if we wouldn't see this uh, familiar um, masker benefit uh, reemerge. Anyway, I'm hopeful. Okay, um, I've got about 10 minutes left according to my um, timer here. So I'm going to tell you about two more experiments that we've done exploring this familiar voice benefit a little bit more. I think it's quite natural to ask once you've determined that um, a familiar voice helps. It's natural to ask, well, what, what is it about the familiar voice that, that's helping? So um, a postdoc in my lab, Emma Holmes, asked that question. And uh, she contrasted two kinds of helping Right, that if there are two kinds of benefit you can get from a familiar voice. So to this point, I've been talking about the benefit you get from a familiar voice when you're listening in um, environments where there are, there's a competing talker present. But of course, you know, we also use familiar voices to tell us who we're talking to, right? So we can ask, do the same acoustic characteristics that benefit identity recognition benefit intelligibility? And there's been some research on the kind, the characteristics that people use, um, what helps you in a voice um, to recognize somebody that you know. And both fundamental frequency and vocal tract characteristics have been found to be important for that. Um, but we don't know about um, intelligibility. So just a brief primer on the vocal tract for those of you who um, may have known this at one point but have forgotten. Um, the source filter model of speech production characterizes the vocal source as a complex harmonic tone generated by the vocal fold. So there's a fundamental and then there are um, harmonic components, right, at integer multiples of that fundamental. And the amplitudes of those components fall off as a function of frequency. So this is the glottal source. Here. This is how you would portray it acoustically. As that source passes um, through the articulatory apparatus, the conformation of that articulatory apparatus filters the sound, enhancing some components over others. So here are those resonances. This is the filter 
that a particular shape of the vocal tract will give you, right? So the, um, that this includes the, the tongue and the lips and the mouth as well as um, this bit here. And what results is um, a filtered source with these things called formants, right? And it, it's the formants that tell you a lot about the linguistic characteristics or the linguistic, um, uh, they carry the linguistic information um, in at least uh, vowels. <clears throat> so as the vocal tract gets longer, these resonances change. They, they spread out. And so the spacing between the formants increases. So we can simulate changing the vocal tract length by changing the formant spacing. And that's one thing we, we changed. And the other thing we changed was the, the fundamental frequency, right? So we made that, um, we, we shifted it up, which then increases the spacing between the components as well. Okay, so either we're shifting um, the fundamental frequency, which changes the pitch, makes it higher, or we're changing uh, the vocal tract length, increasing that, okay? Making it longer. And as I said, both of these things um, have been shown to affect identity um, recognition. What uh, Emma did was she um, had two uh, tests that she ran on everybody in counterbalance fashion. Either she'd play a sentence at a time. So again, she used this bug corpus, Bob bought five green shoes. And she'd either play a single stimulus at a time and have people just say, is that your familiar partner or not? And she also ran the intelligibility test with, with two talkers, just as before. Okay, so we have uh, familiar target conditions as before and both unfamiliar conditions as before. But she's manipulating the vocal tract length and the F naught. Okay, so either manipulation is imposed and a two by two factorial, both manipulations are imposed. Couple of signal to noise ratios, because we like to manipulate that, or target to masker ratios. And what she did was psychophysically, she worked out for the listeners uh, what the just noticeable difference was for their partner for the fundamental frequency and the, um, the vocal tract length, the formant spacing. And um, she worked out the 90% 90, 90 just noticeable difference threshold for those things. And then she imposed one J and D of manipulation and found nothing. <laughs> so then she thought, okay, what's the most I can do without it sounding really bad? So she imposed a five J and D manipulation on both of those um, characteristics. And this is what they sound like. So here's an original. Pat lost nine small shoes. And uh, here's the um, manipulated fundamental. Pat lost nine small shoes. And the manipulated um, vocal tract. Pat lost nine small shoes. And both of them together. Pat lost nine small shoes. OK, so they still, I mean, they sound a little bit odd, but they still sound reasonably natural. And uh, what she found was that manipulating the vocal tract length, perhaps not surprisingly, obliterated recognition, right? If you change somebody's vocal tract length, they're not the same person, and we know that acoustically. So uh, these are D primes, and whenever, when we manipulated BTL or we manipulated both, the D prime was not distinguishable from chance, which here was uh, 0.3 because she, she had to transform uh, her data. Um, however, uh, you can see unshifted performance is good, right? People can recognize their, their partner when their partner's voice sounds natural. And they also recognized it when it was uh, pitch shifted, which is also isn't, quite, isn't very surprising because we modulate our pitch quite a lot when we're speaking and people can still recognize you when you change your pitch. Um, I apologize for this graph. <laughs> this is messy. But what you want to do is you want to compare the solid line and the dotted line of the same color. Okay, so we have familiar target, both unfamiliar, uh, familiar target, both unfamiliar for F not manipulated, BTL manipulated, both manipulated, and then the black is the unshifted. And you can see that in all four cases, there's a robust difference between the solid line, which is the familiar talker condition or target condition, and the broken line, which is the, the baseline. And that's uh, shown here. We've, I've just subtracted the dotted line from the solid line in all four cases to give you a benefit score, right? So here's um, that 
um, the benefit of the familiar target over both unfamiliar. And you can see that there's a benefit in all cases. It's slightly higher here in the unshifted case than all three of these other conditions, but these conditions didn't differ from each other. Um, Emma went on to Z-transform all these data and ran an ANOVA to look for an interaction to show that the pattern here is different from the pattern here, and it is. And so what we conclude from that is that um, identity recognition is uh, severely affected. I mean, it's obliterated by large VTL changes, 5J and D-sized um, VTL changes, but not um, when you shift the pitch. And intelligibility is mildly affected by both changes, but only mildly. And so it would appear that explicit identity recognition and the benefit to intelligibility you get from an, um, a familiar talker rely on maybe different acoustic information, right? suggesting that these are different ways of using familiar information. So that we thought was quite interesting. Okay. Um, I have one minute, two minutes. <laughs> no, I only have one. <laughs> okay. The last thing I'm going to talk about is um, well, what happens if you use different kinds of maskers. To this point, the masker has always been another competing phrase. In English, same structure and everything. Um, we thought we'd manipulate the masker to test um, the following um, set of hypotheses. So if the benefit's due to better perception of the familiar voice, if you're just better at hearing, you've got better ears for that familiar voice because it's familiar, then the, the masker shouldn't matter. You should get that benefit regardless of the masker. And that benefit could be due to tar template matching, or maybe um, you know, your filters are tuned to highly familiar voices. Who knows? Your sensitivity. If your sensitivity is better for a familiar voice, you should get the benefit regardless of the masker that's used. If, however, the benefit is due to there being less overlap in the cognitive processes that are engaged by the target voices you're hearing it and that competing masker as you're hearing it, Right? If somehow the familiar voice is relying on slightly different cognitive processes in some way, then you should only see the benefit if the masker is English, comprehensible, you know, familiar, fam um, similar um, in terms of its demands uh, to the target. Okay? So that's what we were testing. And uh, Emma used a slightly different task to the bug corpus, very similar conceptually except this test um, also has um, Spanish and Russian speakers in it, <laughs> so we could test a, a foreign language uh, masker. And so we had a, a factorial design with three different kinds of maskers. Well, I'll start with the, the target. The target was familiar voice, again, so same friends and spouses we've been, we've been looking at. Unfamiliar voices, again, the familiar voices of other people in the experiment. And then the three types of maskers were um, just the same as, as we'd used before. English, um, so native language maskers, okay? It turns out that handily, uh, the people who recorded Spanish and uh, Russian versions of this were bilingual, so we have English versions of those. Um, we also have the Spanish and Russian maskers. And um, we created signal correlated noise, which is simply taking a speech utterance, extracting the amplitude envelope, using that to modify uh, speech spectrum noise. Sounds crunchy. So that was the third kind of masker. And um, these are the, the people she tested. So again, the, the pairs were very similar to pairs we've tested uh, before, so friends and, and spouses. And this is what she found. So this is, uh, she ran this test adaptively. So she was looking for the speech reception threshold, right? So the, 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 the signal to noise ratio that would allow people to get 50% uh, of the trials right, okay? So a low number means that you're really good at this, right? A number that's closer to zero means that mm, you really need a higher, a more advantageous signal to noise ratio to do the test properly. So what she found was for the native speech, first the, um, these values you can see are, are quite close to zero. They're, they're relatively high, but there's a big difference between them, and that's that familiar target benefit again. When the speech, when the masker was foreign, we see that actually you can do this test a lot better <laughs> with a foreign masker. It's a lot easier 
Um, and there wasn't as much of a difference between the familiar and the unfamiliar talkers. And then when the uh, masker was that crunchy noise, there was no difference here. So that suggested to us that, um, well, first of all, I mean, ob we observe that the type of masker matters. Um, the benefit's not due to better perception of the familiar um, target voice, right? It's not due to better sensitivity for that target voice per se. Um, it seems to be due to cognitive factors. Um, we think that speech spoken by familiar and unfamiliar talkers may be perceived using, um, well, using cognitive systems that are, are somewhat uh, disjoint. And this may be compatible with an episodic account of speech recognition, um, such that if you are familiar with somebody, you store their voice and maybe tokens of their speech episodically, and maybe that's how you're retrieving um, the, the meaning uh, of these sentences or the words um, in these sentences when that talker is familiar. That would be one way that the cognitive process is engaged by familiar and unfamiliar speech could be distinct. So in conclusion, um, familiar voices are easier to understand, yay. Good news for all of us. Um, they may help when they're the competing speech. Jury's out. Hope so. Not sure. Got to do more tests. Um, voices of close friends seem to be as beneficial as voices of uh, long-term spouses. And we're looking into how, how long it takes uh, somebody to develop this intelligibility benefit. How long does it take before you have the maximum benefit? Um, acoustic correlates of vocal tract length are very important for interpersonal recognition, perhaps not surprisingly, since we don't change our vocal tract length very much and we do change our pitch. Um, even large manipulations, though, of pitch and form and spacing didn't eradicate the familiarity benefit to intelligibility, suggesting that, well, there's some other information in the voice, some other um, information in the acoustics that people are using to uh, derive this intelligibility benefit. We don't know what those are. And the familiar benefit to intelligibility seems to be due to cognitive factors. That, and this is like the uh, result I showed you for the very first study, right, where I showed that older people didn't show any kind of decrement when they were listening to their familiar uh, partner. Um, so this seems to facilitate cognition um, in some interesting way that we don't know very much about. Um, and in case you're interested in what we're doing now, um, we're wondering about voice learning. What's the most efficient way to learn a voice? How long do you have to be exposed to somebody? Is it duration or is it experience um, that matters? Um, can we replicate our finding with more naturalistic materials? Because we don't go around saying, ready, Baron, go to Green 7 now. Um, and so it would be nice to be able to replicate this. I am worried about that bias problem that I mentioned earlier, where people will report maybe more or guess more at voices if they're familiar, but well, I'm sure we can um, there are ways to overcome that problem. Um, we're starting to take this into imaging to see whether representations for familiar voices are different in some way to those for unfamiliar voices. Um, and in general, I'm just really interested in the effect of unattended material, the, how, the familiarity of that unattended material on perceptual organization of attended material. Right. So. Um, well, perceptual organization generally, so that you can uh, hear that, that attended material better. Um, and this cognitive difference, what is it? You know, how, how are familiar voices processed differently from unfamiliar voices? So with that, I will finish with thanks to um, Izzy and Emma and Fabienne and Bob and you for listening to me. Thank you. Nice talk, Ingrid. Um, I'm just wondering, in the thing of filtering out distractors, um, if you might do well to look for people who regularly have to learn to filter out distractors, say, for example, someone who lives next to some train tracks or, or some kinds of sounds like that, or someone <laughs> whose voice you deliberately <laughs> want to filter out. Maybe that's where you get into the mother's voice. <laughs> yeah. No, it's... Um, so... Do you think that would generalize, or are you suggesting looking at their ability to filter out things that we know they can filter out? 
Yeah, things where the, a situation yeah. where someone may be much more likely to, to have to a lot filter, of practice yeah. Uh, yeah. suppressing yeah, something. Yeah, no, that's a great like idea. So they in our old us. building, you could have tested me with the backup sound of the Tim Hortons delivery truck, for example. <laughs> right. Yes, or the howlers on the door. <laughs> Hi, really interesting talk. Not, not something I know a lot about, but let me try to ask you. I was just trying to think about what processes you have to go through in order to perform the task and where the difficulty is arising. So it could be that you have to separate, the difficulty could be in separating the two signals yeah, so that you that fail hard. to separate mm -hmm. or that you're having difficulty processing the selected signal because of the, the unattended signal in some way that's not due to separation. Or I, I guess yeah. what, what I was, or you could be getting both signals and you had to you know, determine which one was the target signal and which one was not. Uh, so uh, one question that came to mind is in your barren thing, I wonder what you would find in your different conditions if you ask people to report both of the coordinates. Uh, yes. So that the, f the familiar masker, it's you might true. do better reporting yeah. the um, un atten you know, unattended coordinates and you might still do better reporting the attended ones and maybe that could give you some some additional clues as to what's going on. Yeah, that's, um, that's not something we've done. I mean, that is what um, we surmise, um, think might be going on, but we haven't tested it. You're absolutely right. We, I would predict that people would be able to report both, both coordinates because um, in terms of the information, it is all there. Uh, when you hear these two talker mixtures, you can um, hear both of them. And with the coordinate response measure procedure where it's just the color number coordinates, you can hear both and report them. I mean, if you listen, it's pretty straightforward, actually. Um, your other question about why uh, interrogating patterns of performance in more detail, this is why we've, we've, we have looked at errors, the types of errors people make, and um, trying to infer from the patterns of errors what might be going on, right? And uh, so it's quite interesting um, and perhaps not entirely consistent with a perceptual segregation explanation that mixed voice errors don't differ amongst mm -hmm. our conditions, that right? So people, uh, those are the errors where people are taking some elements from the one stream and elements from the other stream and, and reporting you know, that's a sign that things aren't segregated. And if people were using familiar voices to segregate, then we should see fewer mixed voice errors in that familiar masker condition, and, and we don't. Yeah, we see fewer wrong voice errors. People are, are very good about not reporting their spouse voice, um, but we don't see fewer uh, mixed voice errors. Yeah. Yes, and we haven't, we haven't looked at that. Yes, yeah. We've uh, looked at random errors where people are reporting words that weren't in either sentence or when people are reporting wrong voice errors. But we haven't looked for the signature that you would see if people were segregating but then going for the wrong one versus yeah, mixing up. It's a good point. Yeah. Hi, Ingrid. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I always enjoy these examples of the uh, uh, masked uh, speech and, and vocoded speech. And there was one example that uh, I had never seen before, and I was very impressed that you can actually prime people or give information, cognitive information, by a written sentence mm. instead of a spoken sentence. And that seems to speak to me uh, in in terms of. I, I'm on the thesis committee for a student in Georgetown at the moment uh, that's, uh, who studies reading. Mm -hmm. So um, the big debate seems to be, or uh, seems to be again, whether the visual signals that we use when we read are reprocessed uh, and transferred into the auditory domain before we actually understand this. Okay. And, and this example seems to speak very clearly in favor of that auditory recoding. And I don't know whether you have an opinion on that, whether, whether you know, one could actually use this. I mean, this is a big, big topic in dyslexia, for example. You know, does, uh, is dyslexia a visual uh, uh, a disorder or is it an auditory disorder? And, and, and these kinds of examples, I think, speak to the fact that audition is much more involved in reading than we actually think. 
Yeah, well, what we don't know is whether it's obligatory or not. Certainly, um, the red forms can make contact with auditory sound forms if it's helpful. Um, I mean, what's interesting in a, in a multilingual um, group like this is that, well, what I don't know is whether that example works equally well if you are not a British English speaker. It works okay for me, but I, I know those materials well. So, I mean, I guess empirically you could ask, uh, does the, well, yeah, D does, does that, um, does the word prime help you just as much if you are um, a native British English speaker or if you are an American English speaker or if English is your second language or your third language? Yeah, I, that we don't know. But to, to answer your question, um, I don't think this tells us anything about whether that auditory information is obligatory, right? It, certainly those well, written representations contact auditory. It may, not be, it, it may auditory, not be early but auditory, but it is certainly, you know, since it works in terms of auditory masking, in, in, in yeah. terms of auditory, uh, uh, you know, like the other examples that you've, you've shown, it does suggest that it's beyond the visual domain at the very least. Sure, and but it, it doesn't really tell you whether it's helping the reading which I think is what your question was, wasn't it? Well, I mean, the other question would be, for example, in language acquisition. Uh, people are puzzled by that same question, you know, is it, how do little kids who don't know language uh, uh, figure out what the words are, you know, the word borders, uh, that you don't have, you don't have a space in your, in your speech, as you pointed out, you know, so where are the uh, breaks between the words and how do they figure that out? So one could argue the same way that they, uh, you know, they have a certain amount of words that they learn, you know, s s um, separately, uh, and then they they stand out in terms of the the, the mask and target, okay, as you call it, I think, and uh, then uh, sort of use that as a scaffold to, uh, it, you know, I, it's maybe not the debate that we should have right now, but but I was very impressed by all this. Thanks. So thank you, that was very good. Um, when you said in the beginning that the familiar distractor makes you better, it was so unintuitive to me that I was sure I misheard you. Because I would have thought that a familiar distractor would make you worse because your attention would be shifted towards that and it would be harder for you to, to focus on the target. Yeah. So then my question is, what happens and what would you predict, I don't know if you've tested it, if you have both a familiar target and a familiar distractor? No, and, and it seems, if anything, to be helping them. So I, I believe your data is just unintuitive. Yeah. But then, so I wonder if there's any, so when there's one familiar, when there's only one familiar voice, then maybe you can use that information to ignore it. But what happens when there are two familiar voices yeah. and will, they, will there be an interaction? consistent um, effect here where the familiar masker performance mm -hmm. is below the novel baseline performance right? suggesting that you know maybe maybe people are um, potentially biased but this is not 
Um, I, I'm interested in, this is a good slide for this question, I think, the process by which you identify a familiar voice or a voice as familiar. Right. How do you know? And I thought that the, um, the sort of speculation that you presented about it maybe being dependent on episodic memory is very intriguing because it suggests that there are other cues aside from the sound itself that might be priming people in some way and that could allow it to extend far beyond you know, an individual partner or, or friends, right? So if, I, you could do an episodic memory experiment you know, where you introduce faces that are paired with voices and can you induce these sorts of effects or does it require extensive experience? Books, no effect at all. So no benefit. Even from six hours of listening to an audiobook, people were no better at hearing, at, at, at understanding that voice when it was producing sentences like this. Um, which I find peculiar. People in the past have trained voices, but they've trained them with a little bit more information. So they've had people explicitly attend to the voice and then assign a name to it. So they've given it an identity. And I wonder if there's Hearing a voice is a vehicle for content, in which case you don't pay any attention to the voice at all, or explicitly learning something about a, a voice. Uh, sorry, that's not intended. No, no, that's exactly what I was, uh, you know, in the, in the social cognition literature, they often do these manipulations of providing personality details, vignettes about somebody's behavior yeah. to try to build up really rich uh, identities, and I wonder yeah. if you could get and better, I, faster learning of voices in that case. Yes, we're wondering exactly the same thing. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's just really an empirical question. So in the uh, sentence reading priming thing that you showed, uh, if you just give half the sentence, does that prime the whole? Um, uh, so in other words, if they just hear the first couple of oh, words, yes. uh, do, do, can they still disembed the entire yes. thing? Yes. I, we haven't done that, but we've done something similar, uh -huh. where instead of giving people the verbatim sentence, we give them words that are um, are semantically related to words in the sentence. Oh, yeah. In fact, they were, they were sort of like uh, newspaper headlines. I can't recall any offhand. But the important thing is they were three words for each sentence, and the words did not appear in the sentence, or any of the morphological variants didn't appear in the sentence. They were just related in meaning mm -hmm. to the sentence meaning. And that uh, produces an enhanced um, intelligibility. Mm. Yeah, you get the same kind yeah. of effect. Well, similar. It's not as big, but. Thank you. Just a question out of pure curiosity. The most familiar, but in some ways also least familiar voice we have experience with is our own. Um, yeah. If you test that, what does it look like? You get a target benefit. We did that with the mums. So we oh, did. I didn't, we, I didn't <laughs> no, no, no. I, I didn't mention it. So um, I don't have the data for that precise condition here, but we tested a subset of, we, we recorded uh, mothers. And we then tested the children and the mothers. So we tested the children listening to their mom's voice and other moms. And we found, a, as you might expect, you know, they were better at hearing their own mom than other moms. And, and they weren't very good at ignoring their moms, so that's good. Um, we also tested the moms with their own voice and the voices of other moms. And we found a benefit there. It was, um, it, it looked similar in size. The study was a little underpowered, but it's such a robust effect that it was significant, but it didn't really allow us to compare it in magnitude to benefits we've seen in other studies. But there's definitely a benefit there for hearing your own voice. Now, of course, when you hear your voice recorded, it's not the same, right? Yeah, yeah but we still see the benefit. Um, I was wondering about um, the uh, familiarity definition here, um, uh, or maybe the function of the familiarity, because uh, uh, you, uh, you may think that maybe um, um, the thing that drives um, the significance uh, for the familiarity voice is um, the um, um, is the beneficiary 
of the of the voice for the um, for the person who hears it. And what I mean is that uh, um, you might uh, hear some voice uh, not very often, but it is very significant for you. You can benefit for hearing this voice. Maybe it can warn you. Maybe uh, you get some emotional uh, uh, strength from it. Um, and maybe that's what drives um, the, the whole modulation of, of, uh, of the signal that you hear. Right. So you're saying it's not so much the experience per se, right. it's the, the quality of the relationship. Right. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting point. And I think it's kind of um, related to what Nick was saying earlier, right? Like these voices have to be meaningful to you in some way. Whatever was the significance of that person to you, if that's going to, um, in some way, Just to ask a, a quick question about the priming phenomena that everybody's talking about. So you know that certainly within vision, you can show people a stimulus and they have absolutely no idea what they're looking at. Uh -huh. And you can give a cue, maybe a verbal cue, it's a dog, and then they instantly disambiguate the stimulus. Mm -hmm. And now anytime they see it in the future, they instantly do it and it seems to last forever. Uh -huh. Is there, so going back to the Mary had a little lamb phenomena, oh. once people do that, yeah. Can you hear does it? that last? Will they disambiguate immediately the way you do in vision? Yeah, no. Um, I have to say that both, so this was the demonstration with the inchoate tone pips, and then the Mary had a little lamb as well. I don't think they stand the test of time so well, but this thing, right? <laughs> That lasts. I don't know. Did it last? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, and um, it seems to last for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that anybody's ever ever looked at how long it persists. Um, but anecdotally, I can tell you it, it seems to persist. Yeah. For this particular thing, right? So we have done studies where we've looked at how well you know, learning on this generalizes to new, to new sentences and new words. And that does seem to happen reasonably quickly. Um, we don't know how long that lasts either. That's a different, it's probably a different kind of thing to, to learning a specific instance. Um, if, if I understood correctly, um, it seems that the same familiarity effect could work also with music and with uh, voices, right? So I was wondering what is common between these two things. And in music, obviously, you have predictability, right? You know the tempo and these things, so you, you can predict what comes next. So I was wondering in the voice if a similar phenomenon could occur also, like the prosody of the voice, that you could actually predict mm -hmm. the stream of sounds that will be produced by that person because you know all this person temporarily speaks, and then you can basically filter out that more clearly. Um, I, he, yes, um, I have two things to say to that question. Um, one is that we did mess with people's natural uh, speaking ways and rates. So we gave them something to read, right, which was the sentence, ready, Baron, go to green seven now, or Bob bought five green bags. And a lot of people, when they read, they read in a very artificial way. It's not like natural, fluent speech. And our people were just like that. They read in this very artificial way. And that stiltedness was further accentuated by the fact that we had this um, timer on the screen, and they had to say particular words in the phrase at particular times so that our phrases would overlap. Well, so we've really messed a lot with that. Now, there are still maybe some information there. I think when people produce words that they know well, that production could be somewhat ballistic, and, and so maybe there's, there are some predictable features within a word if people can be fast enough to use those to anticipate uh, where the word is going. I'm not sure that's necessary in this kind of closed set test where there's a fixed number of things that it could be, and green is different enough from blue <laughs> that you don't need that kind of fine phonetic detail to make the discrimination. Yeah. The other thing that um, is we uh, are embarking on a perhaps cockamamie study. So voices are timbrally distinct. 
right? What sets your voice apart from, um, well, my voice is pitch, but, but also timbre. And uh, so we are interested in the timbre of musical instruments, and we're going to test musicians um, where the target melody is played in, an, in their instrument, the timbre of their instrument, or the maskers in the timbre of their instrument, and asking them to segregate um, an other musical stream played in an instrument that's less familiar to them, and we'll see what happens. So on that note, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Posters and coffee now.